This is the VIP Podcast, Virginia in Politics. Let's listen to host Chris Saxman explore the personalities and policies that connect the Commonwealth. The VIP Podcast is brought to you by the VCTA, Broadband Association of Virginia and Virginia Free. The views and opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the VCTA and Virginia Free or our sponsors. Welcome back to the VIP Podcast. That's Virginia in politics, but also very important people like my new guest, Delegate Amanda Benton. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I am doing quite well. Thank you for having me. the end of session? Finally. Every day feels like a week, but then when you get to the end of the six weeks, it feels like it was just the blink of an eye. And then you've you've been an aide. Now you're a delegate, Mm -hmm. which some people do, Mm -hmm. and you've been able to watch this process for a number of years. 17th session? About 14th. 14th, okay. Um, What would you say describes this session? If you're going to put it on a bumper sticker, three to five words. Chaotic. Okay, let's go with that. Why is it chaotic? Um, I I think the biggest reason is it's been a long time since we've had an in-person short session. So if you look back two years ago, we were virtual for that. And it's a lot Mm -hmm. easier to get from one meeting to another when you're just clicking between links uh, while you're at your house on your laptop. It's a lot harder when you have, you know, a subcommittee meeting that's up in the top of the Capitol. And then you have another one that's, you know, over in the Pocahontas building. Right, right, right. Um, So I think a lot of, you know, running around, uh, there are about 30, I would say, members of the General Assembly who've never actually been here for an in-person short session. So this is their first short session? In person, yes. Which is, in the short session for our audience is a very intense 45, 46 days. It's 60 days in the normal regular session, Mm -hmm. long session. But when you jam it into two less weeks, it's not two less weeks of work. Right. It's the same amount of work. It's the same amount of work. In less time. In less time. And that's what makes it so much more tense. And you throw on top of that the election cycle, which takes place during the short session, throwing on top of that all these new districts right. and all these new primaries, right. which people normally don't have. And you know now you can kind of see the shift a little bit now that we're in this final week of session where people are transitioning a little bit out of the legislative mode, kind of back into that campaign mode and looking toward you know primaries if they have them or what their reconfigured districts look like right. and um, you know very much a, a transition in place there as well, I think. And, in your time, you're, you're probably more of, an, of, a, of a veteran of this than I am because you've actually done it on close up and personal for 14 years. Mm-hmm. Um, since your, your earliest days of being a legislative aide and the, the progress you've seen or lack thereof, how has the, how has the legislature changed in its behavior with one another? My, my sense is this, and this is just my takeaway, mm-hmm. more of a, of, a, more of a distant view. It's more tense. It's far more partisan, and there is less uh, comedy, less camaraderie. Mm-hmm. Is that fair? Um, I, I, I think that's a fair assessment. Obviously, when I was working as a legislative aide, it's it's different. I wasn't one of those people who went out and socialized all the times. I you know all the time I worked for my member and and was sort of isolated in that regard. But my perception was that the members themselves were uh, a little bit more collaborative. It certainly was not as partisan as it is right now. Um, I think we, I mean, I can, I can only speak for my own caucus. We have a lot of camaraderie within our caucus. I mean, I think, um, I think we get along very well and for the most part actually enjoy each other's company. But, you know, the overall climate is certainly, you know, more, more partisan than it used to be. And that's unfortunate because you know this well, but the vast majority of the bills that we pass here are not partisan in nature. I mean, 95%. The he- that's right. I mean, the headlines always focus on those very contentious issues right. or, you know, the little battles that we have. But, you know, by and large, most, most bills are, are, are pretty boring, if you will. Do those uh, large partisan battles that are the highlights, the, if it bleeds, it leads headlines mm-hmm. in the papers? I mean, a lot of people, I don't think, read the papers as much as they used to. Mm-hmm. They really don't, uh, in my estimation. Does that fall into the conversations on those nonpartisan issues that people are trying to work on that do good things like workforce development this year? Does it invade and uh, it, it affect negatively the outcome of those other bills? It can. It can. And I, I think, you know, you, you mentioned workforce development. That was interesting because it, it somehow became very partisan on the House side. Really? But yet on the Senate, it wasn't. Why did it get partisan on the House side? I, I can't answer that. Really? <laughs> um, but if you look at, you know, the votes that came out of committee, it was, it was you know, very close to party line. And then it was not in the Senate. That's so, interesting. Mm-hmm. That's in, because obviously it's an election year. Sure. And, and the it, Democrats aren't going to want to give the Republican governor a win. Right. Without, you know, trying to take you know, a little bit of something for themselves. Right. And I think that that's really what it is, is not wanting to, you know, give the give the governor a win, certainly in an election year. 
and uh, as caucus chair of the majority caucus, uh, how do you find running the caucus and making sure they're doing what they need to be doing to make the trains run on time to get done what y'all want to get done? How's that working for you? Um, I mean, I, I enjoy my colleagues. I find them interesting. And for the most part, they're not that hard to get along with. So I think we reach consensus on most issues without, you know, fighting with each other. I think we've had an, a really good legislative session. The things that we okay. decided to prioritize are the things that we, you know, were able to push through committee and out on the floor. Um, you know, obviously the Senate, you know, sees things differently because they're Democrat majority, we're Republican majority. But the issues that we prioritize, we were we were able to be successful on those, at least on the House side and some of them, you know, on the Senate as well. What, what, what did y'all prioritize? What were you, what was your game plan coming in? Um, you know, workforce development was one, okay. some energy policy, and that's an issue where, you know, we, you know, we, we obviously have a different objective and strategy on the House side than they do on the Senate side, but we were able to coalesce as a caucus around some of the issues that we saw. Um, and, you know, some of the bills were, are, are still moving through the process over on the Senate side there. But, but <clears throat> being able to go back to your constituents and mm -hmm. your first nomination phase and say, okay, we did this, this is what we're working on. We, right. we, this, these were our priorities. Are these base issues, workforce development, energy, was that something when you go back to the local committee meetings and they go, yeah, get in there and keep fighting? Energy for sure. Energy for sure. Absolutely. Why is that? Absolutely. Uh, I think people are really concerned when they look at what's happening in other states. Mm. Uh, you know, you had a cold snap over Christmas and you looked at not Virginia, but the Northeast and right. even some states, you know, to the South and to the West of us, you know, having brownouts and power mm. shortages and things of that nature. And um, I, people certainly take notice. People looked at what happened in Texas last last year. I think it was last year. Maybe it was two yeah, years yeah, ago yeah. now uh, when they had the, the a big cold snap down there and you know they had people without power for a while I, it, absolutely it's something that people ask me about pretty frequently what else are you being uh, asked about frequently in your district from your um, you know education is a, is a perennial issue certainly when the schools were closed during the pandemic and there was extensive learning loss and I think just a lot of you know gaps and achievement sort of opened up mm -hmm. because I mean this was obvious that it was going to occur, but you know, children who were already struggling and didn't have you know, maybe the familial resources or you know whatever they needed to be successful in school, that was just exacerbated by the you know stay-at-home sort of policy. Because if you don't have the structures in place to support you when you're in school, they're not going to support you you know when you're when you're learning at home. Um, so certainly a, a lot of um, concern there. Uh, we're still kind of getting back on back on track, I would say, with education. And, and your and your constituents keep telling talking about this because I I talk to a lot of uh, public school teachers, uh, parents, mm -hmm. uh, just in the normal course of the day, you know, how are things going? What do you do? I'm a teacher. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. There's a there is a great tension within the teaching profession that they're not supported. Uh, the parents uh, seem to, to to support the kids and saying, my my child has done nothing wrong here. Sure. It's 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 on you, the teacher. Yeah. And as a former teacher, I push back and go, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, how do we how do we get parents, teachers, and administrators working together? to educate the children? That, that's a great question. Uh, I don't think that there's a simple answer to that. I'm, I'm like you. I mean, I, I sort of grew up where if you got in trouble at school, you got in twice the trouble when you got home. There oh. was no calling and talking <laughs> to your teacher and, you know, maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Um, and I, that's how I raised my child as, as well. Uh, but that, you know, that's a family structure issue. That's not something that the school can overcorrect oh, yeah. for. I, I think where we do need to look and where we, we could affect change and need to be focusing is there's a striking disconnect between school administration and school teachers. And there's mm. been significant media coverage of this over the past year. Um, there was an article that came out, I think, from Richmond City Schools. There was one over at um, over in the Charlottesville area from Albemarle High School where teachers are saying, you know, students are misbehaving in class. We have no recourse for any sort of, you know, consequences where they are, uh, you know, penalized for their, their bad behavior. And the administration is saying there, there's no behavior problems. And teachers are saying, yes, there are. Right, right. <laughs> We're in the classroom. You're over here. And I think that that's an area where we need to, to focus on policy going forward. And I, again, I don't have an easy answer for that, but that is, that is certainly something that is um, obvious right now. And, you know, the tragedy that happened down in Newport News where the six-year-old, you know, took a, took a gun to school and shot the teacher, the administration from everything that we're seeing in the media was, was aware that there was a problem there. You know, they had already searched the child's backpack. The teachers had complained and said, Hey, wow. you know, we think that there's, um, you know, potential for, for um, you know, a, a negative outcome here, and the administration didn't do anything. Obviously, that principal has has since resigned, but I think that's a st striking example of um, you know the, the the disconnect there between teachers and administration. It and, was, and, and it, 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 as a former teacher, the last thing you want to do is be pitted against your 
your employer. Absolutely. And be able to try to create outcomes for the children. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen this throughout throughout the Commonwealth and the country, but more so in the Commonwealth, especially in the 21 election cycle with Loudoun County mm -hmm. and more recently in Fairfax County with the, uh, the failure to uh, disclose kids' uh, achievements. Sure. Um, it's, it, it's, it almost feels like we need a special session <laughs> just to get just to deal with education alone and start getting people on the same page um, to deal with some of these issues. They're, they're, they're getting to be intractable. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, I, I don't know that a special session would generate any solutions. I unfortunately think it's one of those issues that, again, has I'm not become... calling for a special session. I know. I'm not calling for a special <laughs> session. Please don't call me. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think it's one of those issues that, unfortunately, has become really partisan. Yeah. And um, that's that's very frustrating to see. You know, it's it, it becomes consistently if you know if you're a Republican and you put forward an idea, then it's you know automatically bad, and you know vice versa. Um, and I, I don't know how that is overcome. It seems to have just gotten worse. I would say over the past goes, few goes back past to the, few old, years. the old saying: when the parents fight, the children lose. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was I think I was still in the house. I took my son and dropped him off at his middle school, the one that I went to, mm -hmm. and told the ladies behind the desk, if he gets out of line. You have my permission <laughs> to, 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 to use corporal punishment to straighten him out. Because if, if he gets that bad, I'm fine. Yeah. But I yeah. don't think parents, you know, support the teachers and the administrators as much as they should or in, or instinctively should. Right. Like they used to. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's but a also, generational divide. But I also think I'm it's not... on the parents to engender the relationship and, and engage the parents and say, look, we've got to be on the same team here. Right. Help me out. When I was a baseball coach. People say, "Why is my son playing? Why is my son playing?" I'm like, "How many how many nights a week do you come home from work and, and pitch and catch with him? Mm -hmm. Then don't talk. It's on you at home right. to get this kid ready for school. Right? How do, 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 is there a way to legislate that? I don't think. I don't so. think so. That's tough. I don't think so. It is tough. It's, it's, it's more of a cultural erosion, do we think? Um, I don't. Cultural, generational. You know, I think it's in some ways parenting is easier because you have devices all the time, right? So you can put your kid in front of a device and they're sort of, you know, consumed by that, entertained by that. And you're not as necessarily engaged, I think, as maybe parents were, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Is it easier though? Is it, are the oh, it's easier for the parents. I think it's way easier to put your kid in front of a device and then you can do your own thing and let them be entertained. I don't think that's the best outcome by any stretch of the imagination. Well, how do we, how do we, because we're seeing TikTok. Right. That's, that's been, well, that, that bill, is that bill up this week? Um, that bill is up. Um, I'm trying to remember it was, where it was passed with the with the Senate tie break, and now it's in the House. Right to ban um, TikTok on state devices. But should we go to the next level and say it really shouldn't be in kids' hands either? And I think there's some federal movement actually on that. Um, I, I can't remember who the patron is or who the who the member is up in, in Congress that they're looking at sort of you know age restrictions on some of the social media. I, you know. I didn't grow up in a time where social media was was a thing. I'm still not active on social media. I don't like it. Uh, my son is 21 and he's not a big user of social media. He's, in fact, if you text him, you might get a text back in like three days because he doesn't look at his phone. Okay. Um, but that's more of you know how he was how he was raised. And right, right, right. you know, I, I can't raise everyone's child nor would I want to. But um, <laughs> no. you know, I, I I think that. There should be some things that maybe should be somewhat instinctive as a parent. Is that is that a proper role of government is to regulate as we do other products mm -hmm. age restrictions? Well, we have age restrictions on a lot of things. I mean, when you go to see a movie at the movie theater, they still have R-rated movies, right? And you're supposed to, you know, be in the company of a parent or have an ID. Right. Um, as far as social media goes, I think it's even more insidious. I mean, it, you, it, there's a lot of research showing how you know it changes your um, your, your your brain activity. It literally basically. rewires the brain. But absolutely, absolutely. Especially you know when you look at TikTok and you have just these very you know short segments of of, um, of footage. As far as you know, the federal government regulating it. You know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you can put the horse back in the barn there. Um, I, I certainly think that they should have given it more thought along the way. But, you know, it's, it's hard when things develop as quickly as they do. It feels like a, 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 tro a Trojan horse mm -hmm. of the way culturally uh, that it has exploded. And kids are spending so much time on TikTok, mm -hmm. so much time. And uh, that the, the rewiring of the brain is, is difficult to unwire. And then you take that brain and put it in the classroom. Right. With the with the uh, the lack of attention span, and we see the dramatic fall off in reading scores and math scores, mm -hmm. um, is is there a, is there a nexus there? Do you think? 
I, I mean, I only I could speculate on that. I don't worthy have a firm study? answer. I, I absolutely think it's worthy of study. Like, I don't. I'm not. I don't have TikTok. I've never used TikTok. I don't look at TikTok, so <laughs> I can't. Not blaming you. <laughs> I can't tell you how it works actually, but um, I would I would think that it would have had a significant impact on attention span. Yeah, I think that's I think that's one thing that when you when you're trying to really solve problems that people are dealing with and do it in a constructive way that don't invade their personal privacy and their rights. Mm -hmm. But there's a responsibility culturally and uh, societally that government does say, look, this is not healthy. Right. This is this is this is like, you know, in, in inhaling smoke mm -hmm. at a very young age and it's, your lungs aren't developed yet or ingesting alcohol at a young age. You're just not there yet. Right. And we have to be able to regulate or be able to you know, at some level, I think, as a parent of four kids who have seen numerous kids come in our house with all their friends and their sleepovers and whatnot, you know, over time, it's just not healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay, in my estimation, to say, hang on a tick. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> you know, we need to do something better for our children. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that, do you think the caucus would embrace that? I mean, I don't... As a, at the outset, like, look, guys, we've got to do something here. I don't think that that's something that Virginia can regulate, I guess is what no, I no, would no, say. No, 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 but from, but... from a, well, in a, in a manner of speaking, you can in classrooms because Certainly the, you can the, the classrooms classroom. are very digitized. They are very digitized. Digi um, digitized? Digitized? Digitized, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, I, I chose to send my child to a school that did not have any devices. So oh. there were no computers in the classroom. Okay. You couldn't have a device with you. There was zero. Um, and that was a choice that I... I actively made and because what school was this? Uh, he went to Providence Classical School in Williamsburg, okay. and uh, I thought that that was the desirable, you know, way of, of learning because right. it forced you to, you know, focus I think more closely on, um, you know, the subject matter at hand. Uh, as far as you know, public schools they've kind of all in embraced technology and using your phone and uh, even using it as a working? learning tool. I don't working? think it's I don't think it's working, but you know, I'm maybe I'm just old. No, no, no. I mean, look. I mean, we we ha we go through these these cycles in life and mm -hmm. in in, um, in time here, where we kind of go. If I was a teacher today, I would ban all electronic devices. Right. And I think that they've tried that in certain schools. Um, I know some schools do have a no device policy. There is an issue there with parents, though, because parents get concerned as well, and they say, "Well, what if something, you know, heaven forbid, goes really wrong in the classroom, and my, you know, there's an active shooter or something like that? I want my child to be able to have a device so they can make a phone call and call 911 or call, contact me." Yeah, that that's the old dodge. My my kids mm -hmm. sold me on getting cell phones at a young age when they were 14. Well, what, what if something happens? So I'm like, you know. Something was going to happen when I was 14 or 15, <laughs> <That's right>. too. <laughs> we went and got the house phone and That's right. picked up somebody. I'm like, uh, you I remember, you had to call your parents, collect, and then just hang up right, and hope right, that they knew where you were right, so they could come get you. Right. Times have changed. I know, I know, I know your time is, is pressing. Let's, uh, let's move to your, uh, your election. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a competition for the nomination? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, let's knock on some wood there. Mm -hmm. How about the uh, the general? What's it looking like in your new district? Um, so it's a it's a competitive district. It was about 55 45 before. Now it's about 52 48. Um, I don't know who the nominee will be on the other side, but I imagine that there will will be are, one. Are, are candidates announced? Um, I, I'm aware of one person who has okay. expressed interest, but I, I don't know if they'll be right. the ultimate candidate or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how does the House look overall for the Republicans? For the upcoming election cycle, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it looks good. I think the, you know, the, um, I, I, I feel positive about it. I mean, it's obviously challenging, and we have new districts, and I think that there's a lot of proactive engagement right now among my colleagues to try to go out and meet the folks who are, uh, you know, in the new parts of their district. But I mean, I think that, um, I think things look good for us this upcoming year. What I've noticed this year in this in this in this cycle, because of all the different changes, the the, the new elections, the new districts, the short session, mm -hmm. the tension, the new uh, coming back and meeting together personally, I'm I don't feel a narrative in this session. It's mm -hmm. like this versus that. Mm -hmm. There's no big clash of ideas here. Fair? Not really. That's fair. Okay. I mean, I'm I, cause I, cause I wrote about this and I was like, oh, I might've gotten on the edge of this one. I don't want to offend people. But then again, it's my job to report what yeah. I see. And I just don't see it this year. Yeah. Like there's no big tax increase or tax cut. I mean, there is to a degree, there but, it's is. Not, but it's not, but it's not pushed. It hasn't bubbled up. Right. Right. Um, and I mean, I think a lot of that is just, you know, the, the nature that we have right now where we have, you know, one, uh, one party in charge of one body and then the other party is in charge of the other body. And, you know, realistically, you kind of know where your ideas are headed. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, we walked in with clear eyes knowing that. And there's some things that, you know, some things that you you pursue because it's the right thing to pursue. And, you know, you think maybe you can change some minds along the way or it's you know good messaging or it's something that you 
um, you know, that you ran on, but there's other issues that realistically, you kind of know what happened to the bill last year, or you, you know what's going to happen in the Senate. Right. And on top of that, in the House, you're only allowed to carry 15 bills. So you have to be judicious in the legislation that you carry. Right, right, right. Um, and if you want to make a statement, great, but there are, you know, certainly for me, there are a lot of things that I carry because they were brought to me by, you know, constituents or, um, you know, there are regulatory changes that need to be made. So, and you want that to succeed. So you might not use one of your 15 slots for a bill that you know is you know, doomed in the Senate. The dynamic of a bicameral legislature with, mm -hmm. with two parties in control. I like to tell everyone that everything that we do right now is bipartisan. And it's true because every bill that has comes out of the House has, has to, to have, you know, support to. from the Senate and it vice versa. To. And, um, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, when, when I was elected, I hate to keep going back to this, but it was right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And you had to be more bipartisan than your partisan opponent. Mm -hmm. Literally, that's how, you, that's how you presented yourself to the, to the, to the public. Sure. Um, if there was one bill you could wave a magic wand over, mm -hmm. you were queen for a day, what would you do? One bill, huh? It Just has to be one from this year? No, no, no. Oh. No, no, no. Future, past, whatever you need. Um, well, there's World according a, to Amanda. Uh, there's a lot of different things. I, I, I do have concerns about energy policy, and okay. I, um, I don't like the fact that we linked ourselves to California's standards. And so it would probably be something in the energy realm to okay. ensure that we have reliable, affordable energy in the Commonwealth. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a rate payer as well, so I look sure, at, sure. you know, my power bill going up every month, and it concerns me. Well, it does as, for for me as well, having represented a very rural part of the state, mm -hmm. I don't know how you get that done. That's right. I mean, I see these bills. I'm like, have you ever been to Highland County? That's right. It, it's just, it, it's just not possible in my mm -hmm. estimation. Um, all right, favorite book. Let's do a little rapid fire here. Favorite oh. book. Oh, I don't know that I can pick a favorite book. I have a lot of different books that I like. Um, Top of mind. Love in the Time of Cholera. Okay. All right. Favorite TV show. What did you watch growing up as a kid? Get Smart. Really? Yeah. Get Smart? I think we've had some good ones lately. Ellen Campbell was uh, Love Boat. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Love Boat? Fantastic. Favorite movie? Uh, I don't have a favorite movie. I'm not a big movie watcher. Ever? Growing up as a kid? What, what I'm not you... a big movie watcher. To this day. You don't do Netflix. You don't binge. You don't nope. do that stuff. I don't. That must be quite healthy. Uh, what do you, what's your podcasts. Favorite? I do podcasts. Well, tell me about podcasts. You like podcasts. I do. I, do. I love podcasts. Um, Why do you like podcasts? Because you can do other things while you're listening. So ah. you can, you know, work around your house or you Multitask. can. Multitask. Yeah. You can work, work while you're, while you're listening. So yard work, all those things. Okay. What's yeah. your favorite podcast? Um, I'm listening to one right now. It's a series called American Scandal. And it, it looks at, you know, significant events in American history uh, like the situation in Waco is one oh, of yeah. the season. Uh, they talk about the you know Cuban Missile Crisis, so it's really interesting. It's it's narrative and it's you know historic, and I enjoy that. So, favorite, favorite hobbies? What do you do? Like what do you do in your spare time? Cooking. Coding. Cooking. Oh, cooking. Oh, cooking. thank you. And voting. Cooking. Voting. Voting and cooking. What do you like to cook? I'm gonna cook myself. Everything. Everything. I favorite cuisine. Uh, everything. I don't like to make the same recipe more than once. But you just. You're just knocking it out of the park today. That's <laughs> I'm the same way. I don't like working with recipes, and when I do, I follow it. And it's always usually the best time I ever make it was when I follow the recipe. Then I do my own variation. Mm -hmm. um, if you had to, if you had to cook for the holidays, what's the one meal you'd want to make? Uh, beef Wellington. Beef Wellington. Mm -hmm. That's complicated. I made it this year for New Year's. How'd it go? Perfectly. Would you Would you serve with it? What did I serve with it? I cannot recall off the top of my head what I served with it. In the past, I've served a risotto. Um, usually, we have dinner with friends, so someone will bring a side dish. Okay. Mm -hmm. Favorite favorite dish of all time? That leaf went. Oh man, that because like when the guy with Daniel Radcliffe who played Harry Potter, mm -hmm. when he says the best meal he's ever had was at Buckhead's here in Richmond. Really? Mm -hmm. You're talking about the best meal I've ever had? Yeah. Oh. Um, Are you a foodie? I am. That is really difficult. I don't know that I can narrow that down. So some of my to. favorite I food need, destinations. I need, I need your top three right now. I need uh, okay. So San Francisco Quince, I think was the name of it. Okay. Um, and Charleston Zero. So you're a foodie. And in Chicago, I think it was Smith, Lake Smith County, Virginia. Okay. Named after. Smithy. <laughs> How about in Richmond? Favorite restaurants? Where do you like to go? Um, I like to go to La Mer at the bar. The Jefferson. Nice. Well played. My daughter got married. Oh, the that's Jefferson. a great venue. Well, delegate 
caucus chair, Amanda. I know, Bat. i got to get to caucus. They're all going to be sitting joining, there. <laughs> thank you for joining us on the <laughs> VIP podcast. I've really enjoyed, especially about talking about cooking. That's why we ask these questions. You do have a relationship that way. On the VIP podcast, available on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple. Since you're a podcast friend, you should subscribe, like, and share like everybody else should. Thanks for joining us, and we'll be back with another great guest on the VIP podcast.